really makes sense, it says it's a what? A blessing in disguise. Because all blessings don't come looking like a blessing all the time. Sometimes it look, it look like bad. I had some stuff happen to me in my life. I said, oh, that's terrible. That's the worst thing could ever happen. And really, it was the best thing that could happen. But I didn't know. Because God know the whole story. God see around the corner, down the street, and everywhere. We don't see that. So that's what we have to remember. If you stay focused on God, you're going to find out it's going to end up good. All things. Romans 8. Pick it up right there. We're going to read that one verse, and we're going to come back when we get to the end of the lesson, and we're going to understand it for sure. Romans 8 and verse 28. Go ahead. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So that's where the title comes from, right there. And he said it. And, and unfortunately, everybody don't know it, but those that know the Bible, know the truth, we know so he said, and we know that all things work together for good. So I threw in even bad things. I, that's why I put that in parentheses, because that's not the direct quote. I threw that in, but that's really the implication here. That's really what he's trying to show you. Because, you know, obviously if it's some good stuff, you, gonna, you ain't going to have no problem with that. You know, like the past on TV saying, y'all going to get some money. I know that's what people want to hear, too. You're going to get some money. They, and they have some people come up there and witness say, that was right, Pastor so-and-so, Pastor Money Man so-and-so said I was going to get some money. And I went home. It was a check for $67,000 in my mailbox. I'm like, just out the blue? You didn't work? You didn't expect it? It was insurance? You I mean, that's... I, I told somebody that once, I said, I got a feeling some of y'all are going to get some money this week, provided you took your tail to work last week. <laughs> That's what you got to do. But they got that feel-good stuff. So, but like I say all the time, brother and sister, you don't have to really, you know, work too hard to handle the good stuff. When it's good, it's good. So that's why I put in parentheses even bad things because that's what you have to work hard to handle. When the bad things happen, you have to understand that it's going to work for good. That's what you have to understand. So that's what he says here. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. So now let's look at it. Verse uh, Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24, because there will be some bad things and negative things popping up in your life designed to knock you off course with God. And you got to understand, as long as you stay the course, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. That's what you have to remind yourself. Proverbs 24, we're going to read that one verse, verse 10. See, we got a lot of scripture to back up the text because that's what the Bible is. All of these writers kind of wrote about the same thing in different times and different ways. They wrote about the same thing because it's, it's, it's ultimately one message showing you how to get salvation, how to save yourself, how to live forever. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. Read that one verse, my brother. Verse 10. Proverbs 24 and verse 10. Read. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. He said, if thou faint, that means it's a possibility, right? And that show you God, he put the ability in your hand, but you have, to, you have to overcome, as he says repeatedly. That's why he said, if thou faint. So that means it's going to be some days of adversity. There will be some problems pop up, and your goal is not to faint, not to throw in the towel, and, and continue to do right. Because a lot of times, Satan is tempting you to sin. Because we got, a, you got, a lot of times you have multiple ways how to handle a situation. And you don't want to handle the situation a bad way. Even though maybe you used to would handle it. And that's what make it hard. When you used to would handle a bad situation your way, but it wasn't the right way. So, he, but he's telling you, if you faint, that means it's an option. In the day of adversity, that strength is small. 
But what will help you not to faint is knowing that, hey, if you if you working with God, God going to handle it. It's just something temporary. Let's go further. Go to, uh, matter of fact, I'm going to throw this in here. Go to Galatians 6 right quick. Go to Galatians 6. If I was in church, I'd say the Spirit just spoke to me <laughs> and told me. But the Spirit do remind you, I didn't hear a voice. <laughs> Galatians 6, just to show you that that's what, it, that's what the setup is. I was just reading this this morning on the airplane. That's why I popped in my mind. Galatians 6. Now, he said over there, if you faint in a day of adversity, y your strength is small. So let's, re let's see where we're going to start at. Galatians 6, we might just cut to the chase. Galatians 6 and verse uh, 9. Galatians 6 and verse 9. Read that. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Uh-huh. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You see what he said? Same thing. <clears throat> see, you're doing good. You're doing what you're supposed to do. But it will get tiresome. It'll get weary. Stuff not, everything not working like you want it to work. It will make you want to say, what the heck I'm doing this for? So that's what the game plan is from Satan, to get you to throw the towel in. Have you... Could, Convicted. That's why I say in 1 John that you can, if you're doing God's will, you can assure your hearts before him. But then it turned around and said, nevertheless, if our heart condemn us, because sometimes your heart can condemn you unjustly, unnecessary. But God is greater than our heart, though. That's what it said. So he said, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. See, we're going to reap the benefits of doing God's will eventually. He show you little tidbits, little signs now, and he take care of you now, but we really looking for the big payoff in the end. But you, you have to overcome the adversity. So that's why he said, let us not be weary and well do. For in due season, we shall reap what again? If we faint not. If we faint not. That lets you know. See, people say, oh, I came to the Lord. I got saved. It's all good. Everything is good. No, you couldn't be saved if it keep giving you the option to faint. You couldn't be saved. It's an option for you to faint. I mean, you could go back and start handling things the old wicked way. So this is what he's telling you. But now, let's go to, uh, let's look at an example. We're going to skip Ecclesiastes. I'm going to cut some of this to save a little time. Go to Job first. You can read Ecclesiastes 7 on your own. But we're going to go to Job, the first chapter. Since I threw that one in, we're going to move around a little bit. Job, the first chapter, and verse 18, because the Lord used Job as the best example of dealing with some bad things and overcoming it. Job knew it was bigger than whatever was going on in his life at any given time. He knew it was bigger than that. So he didn't get hung up on what was the bad stuff. And you're talking about bad things. The whole, everything, the house collapsed on top of Job. He lost it all. And we're going to read a little bit of Job 1 and verse 18. Job 1 and verse 18. Go ahead, read it. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only have escaped to tell thee. Okay, so now, all of this drama hit Job at one time. And the final punch in the gut was that somebody told him all of his kids had died. And it wasn't even nobody to blame. You know, some, pe some people had robbed him on one front, took some stuff from him. That was uh, the previous messenger told him that. But when the kids died, it, it was it was that a storm came and smoked the four corners. So you ain't got nobody to be mad at. It's, it's a difference between if they just die from a storm or somebody murder them, you could at least take your anger out. So I'm going to get them. I'm mad. How they do that? But no, it was a storm. And they died. That was the final punch in the gut for Job. But how did Job respond to it? Now, that's the epitome. That's why I tell people, some people be going through some hard times and, and they start comparing themselves to Job. I say, that's an insult to Job. 
you haven't went through nothing. <laughs> this in itself tell you haven't been went through nothing. He lost all his kids in one moment. All of them, and he heard about it. All of them was gone. But how did he respond? This is the key to it. How did he respond? Go ahead. Then Job arose and rent his mantle he and ripped, shaved his head. He ripped his mantle and shaved his head because he was devastated. Go ahead. And fell down upon the ground in worship uh -huh. and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Uh -huh. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, Job, had, he had a whole different outlook than most people nowadays. Job knew as much as he was hurting and in pain, you don't have no say-so in the matter. See, we like to bless God when he bless us with something good, even children. But then some people, because see, the goal here was Satan was trying to get Job to curse God. That's what the play, that's why it's always something in play, if you're going to do what you need to do or not. So that's what the goal was. But we... See, and that's why Satan, he hit Job with everything, including the kitchen sink. But we like to bless God when the good stuff happened, and then when the bad stuff happened, like God don't know what he's doing. You want to curse God, be mad at God. Why God let that happen? Why? Why he do that? Must not be no God. People talk real ugly about God. But Job had a different outlook. Job said, well, hey, I know God know what's best regardless. And as a matter of fact, I gave God credit for blessing me with what I had because, hey, he realized, he said, look, I didn't come here with nothing in the first place. So I didn't expect to leave with nothing. He said, I came, naked came I into this world and naked I'm going to leave. The Lord gave. He acknowledged the Lord in everything. See, we want to say the Lord did the good, then we throw it to say the same involved. But what we need to realize is God controls it all. Satan can't do it unless God let him do it. So, Job gave God all the credit. He said, the Lord gave, and the Lord have taken away. And you know what I got to say about that? Blessed be the name of the Lord. The average person would not have responded that way, especially immediately. I'm talking about this was immediately when he found out. Somebody else, you might have came to that conclusion later, but you might have been cursing somebody out immediately. <laughs> But Job got to that conclusion immediately. And that's, what, and that's what the challenge was for him not to faint, for him to keep his integrity with the Lord and not sin. You finish that? No, verse 22. 22, go ahead. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God's foolishness. See, that's, that's what the goal was. Satan was trying to get him to sin and charge God foolishly. Like, how you going to charge God? God run it. Whatever God choose to let happen, he let it happen. Keep yourself in line. Because he's, he's the creator. We ought to create it. So we have to follow him. So Job did, in other words, Job did not faint with the worst day of his life. He did not faint. And Job, through all of his problems, let's flip over to Job uh, 13. Through all his problems that he went through, Job didn't expect to regroup in this life. But he knew it was bigger than this life. He knew it was bigger than this life. He knew it's about the kingdom that's coming. That's what he had his sights on. But he didn't know, show you how fair God is. God had big plans for Job in this life. That's why he wouldn't let Satan kill him. He told Satan, you can do whatever you want to do to my servant Job gonna stand up to it. Go ahead, you can do it. I'm gonna let you do it. Even though he ain't having did nothing wrong or nothing. He's a perfect man. That's what God called Job. And so with all that that Satan did to him, Job still didn't sin, and God blessed him immensely after all that was over with. He gave him more than he had in this life, let alone he's going to get eternal life. But now, Job 13, yeah, we skipped Ecclesiastes. It just tells you, hey, what we found out from this, that God controlled it all. You know, when you have good times, praise God. When you have bad times, consider that God let that happen too. And consider what you need to do to stay right with God. That's what he's telling. And the key to it all is fearing God no matter what. We need a, as people say, a healthy, we need a healthy fear of God. Knowing that he is the one with all the power anyway. You don't have no say so. He told Israel, he said, I am the potter, you the clay. 
And who, how can the clay say to them, why you do that? Why you make me like this? I don't like the way you did. Look, even a kid, a kid that have a toy, and that's what kids do a lot of times. They have a toy, you come in there, the toy all broken up. Like, why you tell the toy? Like, it's my toy. That's what I do. I felt like tearing it up. I smashed it into the wall. But it's theirs. And that's the way God is. But what God is telling you through it all, he is fair. But now, Job uh, 13 and verse 1. And the whole thing was trying to get Job to sin. And he, he passed with flying colors. 13 and 1. Go ahead, read it. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this. Mm -hmm. Mine ear hath heard and understood it. Uh -huh. What ye know? The same do I know also. Uh -huh. I am not inferior unto you. Go ahead. Surely I will speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Uh -huh. Ye are all physicians of no value. See, this was, this was uh, Job's biggest issue, really, in, in the big scheme of things, because his friends came along. Because a lot of times we feel the need something bad happen to somebody around you. You know them. You know, you might go and try to speak something nice to them, comfort them. But sometimes we try to put it all in a little box and make us feel better. You try to point things out and say, well, that happened to them. Even big stuff like, you know, they had, what was that? Was it an earthquake in, in uh, Haiti some years ago? Earthquake in, Ham in Fa Haiti. They had the, uh, what was the thing down in Louisiana? It was the, yeah. So they had the hurricane down there. And so people like to make themselves feel better. Well, see, that happened to them because of this. That happened to them because of this. See, and that's really what they started doing to Job. They, they, they had to come with an explanation to make themselves feel better about it. Because that, you know, Job, you know, you did something now. But you ain't seen, seen them do nothing. You don't have no, I mean, they really started accusing Job. You know, you just, just come clean, Job. Come on. You stole something. You did, because all this bad stuff not going to happen to one person unless they did something wrong. Joe say, you know, y'all not making no sense. And, and that's how sometimes you got to be careful. I've seen people arguing with somebody and they making excellent statements in the argument. But the problem is it don't apply. That's the worst thing. And see, this was from Satan to make Joe blow his top. This was from Satan also. So this is why Job is responding because this was also designed and this what really got him puffed up a little bit because he's trying to tell these cats, look, I ain't did nothing. Y'all don't know what y'all talking about. You know, and he started leaning like, you know, I want God to show y'all. I need to talk to God about this because I haven't did nothing. So this is why Job is responding this way. And this was really, out of all this, this was his bigger challenge. He handled losing everything. Then he, he had a hard time handling these cats coming and accusing him when he hadn't done nothing. But Job maintained his integrity. He said, look, I haven't did nothing. I've been serving God. But so this is why he's dealing with them. He said, what y'all say? Lo, mine I have seen all this. Mine ye have heard and understood it. Verse 2, what ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto thee. Because, you know, bad stuff happened to you. you could, Job said, I had servants. They started looking at me funny, like I stank. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> that's how it is. Everybody love you when things going good. Bad stuff happened. They be like, oh, he stank. I don't know what happened to him. <clears throat> but God just allowing him. So this is what Job is telling them. I know the same thing, you know, because they putting forth all these arguments. They, they, they quote, I mean, it's some good stuff they saying that will fit good in another situation. It just didn't fit with Job. And then Job said, I, I don't even got time for you. I want to talk to God to see why all this really went down. That's what verse 3, he says, surely I will speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But I'm going to tell you about you. Verse 4, he said, read it again. But ye are forgers of lies. He said, you are forgers of lies. He, Job was telling the truth. They was lying. That's why in the end, and we're going to look at it, God made them go bow down to Job. He said, you forgers of lies. Go ahead. Ye are all physicians of no value. He said, you physicians of no value because... Actually, they came to Job. He was devastated. They came to Job to try to comfort him. That's a, that was their initial plan. But see, sometimes your, you know, your self-righteousness take over. 
But they went to Job to comfort him initially about all the bad stuff. Look, you don't need to read nothing into what happened. You don't really know what happened. Just comfort the brother. And notice if you pay attention and read the whole story, you find out when they first got to Job, and you might find yourself in these shoes, they didn't say a word. Because it's like sometimes you don't even know what to say. What can I say to this person? They went through all this. You know, I've talked to people that loved ones died or something, and I realized that maybe it's nothing I can really say. I might just sit with them. That's what they did. They sat with Job, it said, for seven days, didn't say a word. You know, maybe just sat there and pat them on the shoulder. They didn't say nothing for seven days, but oh, when they opened their mouth, they made matters worse. And that's what you could do sometimes. You, if you're there to comfort somebody, just stick with comfort. Don't try to critique their life at that moment. Probably should have did that sooner if it was really something wrong. That's just not the time. And that's what they ended up doing. They started trying to tell Joe, we know you did something. Just confess you did something wrong. Stuff like this, look back in history. The righteous don't suffer and all this stuff. Just like, oh, goodness. It's a wonder he didn't hit nobody. <laughs> but this is what was going on. This is why he finally said, you are all forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Verse 5. Oh, that ye would all together hold your peace, mm -hmm. and it should be your wisdom. He said, you know, see, they was nice sometimes. They just said, shut up in a nice way. Just shut up. But he said, it not. oh, that you would all together hold your peace. He said that would be the wisest thing you could do at this moment. But all of this was designed to make Job flip his lid, make him go over the edge. Go to Job 42 and show you how the end came. Because in the end, remember, the title is all things, no matter what it is. If you serve in God and keep your focus on God, all things are going to work together for good. It's going to come out good one way or another. Because you don't know what the future holds, but God knows. <clears throat> Job 42, and pick it up at verse 7. Job 42 and verse 7, read it when you get it. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job. See, Job, the Lord had to snap on Job a little bit because he had got a little carried away. But he really was innocent in the big scheme of things. So the Lord, because you know, you, you, you can't help but start questioning God when stuff happened in your life. Well, I don't know why God let that happen. Like, God don't know what he's doing. So the Lord snapped on Job and said, look, tell me where you was at when I created all this. You know, you start trying to tell God how he should handle things. That's really what we, we try to do sometimes. How are you going to tell the creator who created all this, who created, you worried about your own self all the time, and God dealing with billions of selves billions of people and he managing all of that that's what he started telling Joe where was you at when I hung the sun out there well, you know when I did this where was you at you know so much tell me that and even when it comes you know sometimes we get indignant and we get mad when people do bad wrong stuff and do something which is you can have some righteous indignation when somebody do something wrong but as far as trying to retaliate it's really fruitless because what the Lord told Job really summed it up. He said, look, Job, if you so wise, I tell you what, look on everybody that's proud and put them all in their place. See, God is going to do that. So even if you get mad at somebody for what they did, that's just your own little personal situation. God got to deal with everybody for what they do. And that's the thing. So God had to put Job in his place first. Then it said... It said, it was so after the Lord spoke in these words unto Job, the Lord said to who? To Eliphaz the Temanite, uh -huh. my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. Uh -huh. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job has. See, the Lord was kindled against them three guys. His wrath was kindled against them because they all right condemned Job and didn't have no information. Didn't have, people do that to this day. People be repeating stuff they heard with somebody. They be repeating it, and next thing you know, it's like it's the gospel. But don't, don't nobody even know nothing about it. Go ahead. 
Therefore, take unto you now seven bullets and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, uh -huh. lest I deal with you after your folly. <laughs> lest I deal with you after your folly. They had to go and humble themselves to Job, and Job had to turn around and pray for him, too. He had to pray for him, because this is how Job was going to get out of his situation. He had to still forgive him. They asked for forgiveness. He had to pray for him, and the, the Lord was going to forgive them, and he was going to fix Job's problems. Go ahead. Lest I deal with you after your folly, uh -huh. and you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Uh -huh. What they do? So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite, uh -huh. and did according as the Lord commanded them. And the Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord accepted Job. Go ahead. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. See, that was, a, that was just a curse on Job for that time. But the Lord turned it around. He turned it. After he lost everything. So the Lord ended up turned the captivity of Job. Job didn't even expect it. Job was like, I'm just going to wait to meet God. And I had to talk to him about what, what that went on right here. I got to talk to him about this when I meet him. But I'm going to keep doing right so I can meet him and ask him, what was that all about, Lord? But Job didn't know where because it, it, you can be so devastated sometimes you can't see no light at the end of the tunnel. But even if it's like that, physically, you have to be able to see the spiritual light and know that as long as you walk with God, you're going to be okay. That's what Job stayed focused on. But he didn't see things turning around physically. He didn't see it getting better in his lifetime. Because it's like, oh, this didn't happen. I'm just, I'm, my next step, I'm getting ready to die. That's what he thought. But the Lord turned the captivity of Job and what? When he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. Go ahead. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Gave him twice as much as he had before. Job didn't expect that. Go ahead. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters. Mm -hmm. And all they had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. Uh -huh. And they bemoaned him and comforted him all over the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. See, they comforted him. And they did something else, too. Go ahead. Every man also gave him a piece of money mm -hmm. and everyone an earring of gold. See, that's how he got rich all, because he was rich. He got rich all over again. Verse 12. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. But Job didn't faint. Job stayed the course. He kept his focus on the Lord at the hardest time any of us can even imagine. Go ahead. For he had 14,000 sheep and mm -hmm. 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 she asses. Uh-huh. So he was rich all over again. Flip over to Acts, the 16th chapter. Acts, the 16th chapter. And we're going to get a New Testament example. Because the whole Bible... It's really leading you in the same direction. Old Testament, New Testament, it's leading you in the same direction. Now, it's going to show you some stuff that Paul had to go through. Him and uh, this brother here, I think Silas, that was with him. Uh, Acts 16 and verse 12. Acts 16 and verse 12. Go ahead. And from thence to... And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the, that part of Macedonia, uh -huh. and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. Go ahead. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside. See, a lot of people, they didn't taught us that the Sabbath changed and the New Testament changed to Sunday and, you know, the first day of the week and all that. It haven't changed. These people, Paul kept keeping the Sabbath. And I was talking to a Catholic priest. He heard, he was sitting in one of my lessons years ago in the 80s. He was sitting in a lesson. It was about the Sabbath day. And he was sitting there, and I could see him getting bothered because it was about the Sabbath, showing that the Sabbath is the seventh day. It didn't change to the first day. So I knew he was kind of reason. He had his collar on. He was getting red in the face. So after, and I read some of the, I didn't read this scripture. Uh, I read some other scriptures showing just that the Sabbath, the people continue to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament, the seventh day. Only one day has been called the Sabbath in the whole Bible, and that's seven days. So, so nobody would dispute that. So, but if you're telling me it changed to the first day when Jesus re resurrected, why are they still keeping the Sabbath? All up in Acts and everywhere. They're still keeping it. 
So he came up to me after it was over with and said, well, you know, Paul just kept the Sabbath. You know, he just went to the synagogues. He just, because that's where the people were. So he just went there to preach to them. But, you know, like he was really observing the new Sabbath Sunday, but he just went to preach to people on Saturday, the seventh, the seventh day. So it was about the synagogue. And I just flipped over and read this to him. I'm like, look, it don't matter synagogue or not. The Sabbath is the Sabbath wherever you at, and Paul knew it. So my point to him was, since he based it on the synagogue, and that's where the people were, he was just going there. He really wasn't interested in the Sabbath. They just were there on the Sabbath. I said, well, what's this about? Because right here, obviously, there was no synagogue. But guess what? It's still the Sabbath. So it's the Sabbath wherever you at, synagogue or not. And this is what I showed him. I said, look, because right here it said, and on the Sabbath, where they do, we went out of the city by the riverside. You're still the Sabbath. We are going to meditate on God, church, synagogue, or not. Because, like, we got people that follow us all over the country and even out the country, and they don't have no church to go to. But they still follow. They watch us on the Internet. They meditate in their house. They, they know it's still the Sabbath wherever they at. So that's what Paul knew. It said, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and did what? And spake unto the women which resorted thither. So they just out by the river. You know, but it's not out there to play and how, like, we might go to the beach sometime. It's not that type of party on the Sabbath. We have to do some meditating. We have to focus on the Lord and talk about the Lord because that's what that day is for. So that's what they did. So it didn't have nothing to do with the synagogue. Wasn't no synagogue, but it's still the Sabbath. Go ahead. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyrethea, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Uh huh. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Uh -huh. And she constrained us. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, uh -huh. which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Mm -hmm. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. Uh -huh. And this did she many days. So, so see, sometimes people can be in agreement with, but it can be overbearing. They can still be a distraction. Just like we've been in service like this, you know, it's been different places like in Gary Fence, we've been in service. You know, we don't mind people saying, you know, amen. People talk in here right now. People say something, but you could be overbearing. Like if I had one brother just, he don't start preaching with me. It's like, dude, I don't need no help. Cause it's just a distraction. It's too much. You can amen too much. And, and that's really, even though you not, you not disputing what's being said, it still becomes a distraction. And that's what she was. She was, she was saying something good. She was saying that these men, the thing, because cause she, she had the spirit of Satan on her, really, and she was making money by talking smooth. So she doing that same stuff. She talking, she can't stop talking, really. So the same followed Paul and cried, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God. Which show us the way of salvation. Because sometimes Satan is like, if you can't beat them, bug the heck out of them. <laughs> you can't beat them, join them, and bug the heck out of them. And that's what Satan had her doing. She was bugging the heck out of them. But she's saying good stuff. These men are from God to show us the way of salvation. I'm talking about they just overbearing. We just repeat. These men are from God. Finally, what happened? Verse 18, I'm sorry. And this did she many days. Uh -huh. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. See, he rebuked the spirit that was on her. Now, she was saying the right stuff, right? But she was saying it too much. So much so, you can't even get a word out. You trying to preach. She study over there saying it like, shut up, please. Finally, he turned and rebuked her, and she lost her gift of gal, which was making a lot of people money. And this got Paul and them in trouble. Go ahead. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the ruler uh -huh. and brought them to the magistrate, saying, 
These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city uh -huh. and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive. Go ahead. Neither to observe being Romans. Go ahead. And the multitude rose up together. Now you see what Paul and them going through? He trying to preach the gospel. And then he, he rebuked the spirit on this woman. And now all of a sudden he's in trouble getting locked up for doing nothing wrong. And that, that would challenge your faith in itself. You'd be like, you, you start thinking, why God let that happen to me? I'm in jail. I was doing right. I don't know. But Paul and them didn't lose faith. Because, hey, wherever you at, you can still serve God. We got plenty of brothers in prison right to us. They'd be right, oh, I'm in prison. It's so bad. I'm like, hey, guess what? You can serve God in prison. And, you know, I say all the time, people are not happy in many places where they are. I know Youngsters in college, they don't want to be in college. People don't want to, usually don't want to be. They're not content where they are, which is what you need to be under whatever circumstances you're under. And that comes with trusting God, knowing that it's going to work out no matter what. So now they didn't brought Paul and them up on, Paul and Silas up on charges and got them in trouble. Verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates ripped off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And commanded to beat them, huh? Go ahead. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Uh-huh. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. Now, nah, they, they told the jailer, you better not let, make sure don't, these guys don't get out. So he put them in the inner prison, kind of in a dungeon or something. Well, there ain't no way they're going to get out of there. Go ahead. And made their feet fast in the stocks. And then chained them up to the wall and stuff. Go ahead. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed uh -huh. and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now, you've been locked up, put in prison, haven't did nothing wrong, beat up on, and still you in prison in that predicament. You sitting there praising God, singing praise. This is what Job did. Because when you trust God, you know, it don't matter. It's going to work for good. One way or another. So they start praising God and singing, and the prisoners heard them. Verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, uh -huh. so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. Uh -huh. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. Then the angel came and shook things up, and everybody had, could just walk out the prison. Go ahead. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep. Of course, he was sleeping on the job. Go ahead. <laughs> and seeing the prison doors open, uh -huh. he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. See, he knew he was in trouble if they had got away. So he said, I'm going to kill myself. Go ahead. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Mm -hmm. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. See, and this is the thing, too, brothers and sisters. We don't know why the Lord put us in certain situations. It could be to benefit somebody else. Paul and Silas end up in prison for doing good, and then they was able to do some more good, because now they're going to end up saving this guy and his family. Because they had the right spirit and they didn't let some bad stuff get them down where they couldn't serve God. Go ahead. And brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, that's what, that's what he said. Now, this guy want to be saved behind being a part of beating them up and locking them up. He see that they still got faith. He said, look, I need some of that. What do I need to do to be saved? Verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved Go ahead. in thy house. Uh -huh. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Uh -huh. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. Uh -huh. And he and all, all his straightway. All his whole family got baptized, but he took care of them. You know, they had been beat up. He washed their wounds and all of that. He was the jailer. But go ahead, 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he said, meet before them and rejoice, believing in God with all his house. Now, that's an example of some good stuff coming out of some bad stuff. And that's across the board. Even when it comes down to what Jesus did for us, we don't realize, you know, people often say, well, Jesus died for my sin. Well, hey, that wasn't good that he had to die. But it turned out a good benefit for us. But he had to die for us to get that 
goodness. He had to die. But now go back to the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 30. We're going to look at another example. So we see people, the Old Testament, New Testament, dealing with all kind of hardship, dealing with bad stuff happening, and they won't faint. They maintain it their mindset. They're keeping their mind stayed on God. And that is the challenge for us. That's the challenge. That's the hardest time. It's not when everything going good and you know about God and you serving God, that's the easiest time to serve the Lord. But try it when it start going bad. That's when you got your hands full. And you can do it because none of this stuff don't mean nothing. Like my mother used to say, if it if, if you got to bend with the wind and whatever it is, if it don't break you, if it don't kill you, it'll make you stronger. And if it kill you, it's a mute point anyway. You ain't got to worry about nothing else anyway. So either way, if you keep the, the right mindset, you can overcome. First Samuel. First Samuel 30 and 1. Here's some serves of God in the old days. First Samuel 30 and 1. Read it. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Uh-huh. And had taken the women captives that were therein. See, now this is David and his men. Now they working for the Lord. They've been out there, actually had to run from Saul because Saul was trying to kill David and he hadn't done nothing to him. And so they out, but they still taking care of the Lord's business. But now they went on a venture Supposed to went somewhere with this king, and they came back, and they whole camped and been kidnapped. The, the, it's just like you come home, and your house is burned down, and nobody in your house. And the only good thing about that is you don't see all your family members dead in the house. That's the good thing. That's the best you can get out of that. But it don't look good at all. It said, when they got back on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south of Ziggler and smitten Ziggler and burned it with fire and had taken the women captive, women and children, really, that were there in. Go ahead. They slew not any. They, and that's a good thing. They didn't kill nobody. Go ahead. Either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. They just took all the people, kidnapped the people, took all their stuff. Go ahead. Now, this is, David is a, a servant of God. Top of the line serving a God. But you talking about some bad stuff happening? This is bad. This is not a good day. This is a bad day when you get home and all your whole family been kidnapped. Verse 3. And not just, and we're talking about 600 families, based, give or take some. We ain't talking about just one family. Because David had a bunch of hard men with him. They all have families and they get back and everybody gone. You, you know how when bad stuff happened, and this was about to go on right here, everybody be mad at each other, and they start fighting. We're going to fight. It's your fault. See, I told you. You know, you know. It just turned into a whole nother thing. Go ahead. So David and his men came to the city, uh -huh. and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. See, their wives, their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. This is people that believe in God. These were servants of God, believed in the true and living God. So the question is, are you going to keep believing under circumstances like this? Go ahead. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. Well, that's a natural instinct. So these, are, these are grown men. They crying like babies, though. Of course, David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until when? Until they had no more power to weep. They got it all out. They, they had no more power to weep. <laughs> so, because you devastated. Go ahead. And David's two wives were taken captives. Uh-huh. Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Okay, so David had multiple wives. Was that question come up? That's always a big debate about multiple wives, you know. But look, the Lord ain't had no problem with it. We living in a time where it's not something we need to be worried about now. But, and women hate it, men love it. That's always a consensus. But hey, it went on. This is, this is evident. David was a man of God. So women shouldn't hate it, and men shouldn't just be so enthralled about it, because it wasn't nothing but some more work and some more responsibility. I see brothers trying to do it now, 
Yeah, the brother's trying to get multiple wives to keep from being homeless, and that wasn't the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> I, I know some brothers doing it. They with one woman, she kick them out. How you get kicked out anyway? You shouldn't even be in that position. But the bottom line is, hey, we can't deny. I'm not going to shy away from it that it didn't go on. We reading about it now. But it's a time for everything. It's just like uh, Elisha said when the guy tried to offer him money. He said, is it time for us to be worried about trying to get rich and come up, you know, worried about ourselves? You know, the whole world is, 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 is in disarray. So, but this is it. So all of their families, he had two wives. They both gone. Go ahead. What verse is yeah, Six. Six. Uh-huh. And David was greatly distressed. Uh-huh. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved. Uh-huh. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. Uh-huh. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. See, but look, the people, they were so upset at him because you're going to find somebody to blame when something bad happened. You're going to find something. So David was the leader. So, of course, it's going to come back to him. But half of the people was out there of their own volition. They was out there because David was running from Saul. And then, you know, when you see stuff like that, then you, you having a hard time. You say, man, I'm going to go out there with him because your life wasn't going good anyway. So they out there on their own. But, of course, they mad. They want to take it out on somebody. So now this is the worst time of your life. And it says, rightly so, verse 6, David was greatly distressed because not only do he got to deal with the fact that his family and everybody else's family got taken, he got to deal with the fact that everybody looking at him, yeah, it's his fault. Negro right here. <laughs> you know how we can get, because this is us. This ain't nobody but us. So they look at it, and it said, now this dude, the, most of them know that he's set to be king, but he had a long road to travel to become king. He was on his way to be king, and he officially became king. Most of them know that, but when they come down and you done lost your family, it's like, man, I think we should stone <laughs> That's what they talking about. <laughs> They ready to kill the brother. So he got to deal with losing his family and everybody hating and mad at him like he actually orchestrated this. And see, we're going to find out all things work together for good to them. If you stay the court, this is actually a blessing in disguise for them. You wouldn't have never thought it starting off. It would have been like, what the world is going on? So it said, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. Why? Because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But what did David do? Go ahead. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David did something different. He encouraged himself. That's a heck of a time to encourage himself. Actually, you ain't really got no options at that point. He did the smart thing. They looking at, and that's what you, when you, uh, Realize how God is in control. Bad stuff going to happen. I, you know, we had stuff to happen in Gary. People broke into class and broke in. You know, like, brothers, man, what's going on, man? What's, what? Something must not be right. People, I say, Negro, we know people break in. What do you think we got alarm for? What do you think we got glass blocks in the windows to keep them out? So let's focus on keeping them out. Still, they didn't figure out a way in. But we don't think like, you know, God ain't going to let nothing bad happen. It's all over the Bible. Bad stuff is happening. You just got to deal with it. That's what David figured out. He's like, look, we ain't got no, nowhere to go but seek the Lord. So he said he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Verse 7. And David said to Ahimelech, um, oh, sorry. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son. Go ahead. I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither, thither the ephod. So they had this ephod, which is pretty much like an apron with all kind of diamonds in it. And they would seek the Lord, and the Lord would, would answer them. He'd have them changing stones, changing colors, and everything to give them a certain answer. You know, when the Lord was with them, so they would ask the Lord something, and the Lord would give them an answer through the ephod. So that's what they're going to do. But notice, he is putting the Lord first. He not going to, you know, I seen bad stuff happen to people. They just run off half cock. Oh, I'm going to do this. I seen, I know a brother got robbed. I know the brother person. He got robbed of some stuff. He was out there doing stuff he shouldn't have did in Chicago. He got robbed of his stuff. And then without planning, obviously he didn't seek the Lord. 
he go back to try to get them. He end up dead. Look, you should have just, maybe you should have let that stuff go. You still be living. So David did the right thing to, hey, we need to have a seek the Lord in this matter. So he said, we're going to seek the Lord. Whereas I can hear some of the people in this camp like, well, we need to seek the Lord. We need to figure out where to head and go get him. Well, let's see. What did David ask the Lord? Verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, uh -huh. What did he ask the Lord? Shall I pursue after this truth? Nah, he asked the Lord the question, shall I pursue? He's not just going to even pursue half cock. Most of us might have thought, that's a no-brainer. We need to try to find them. <laughs> well, maybe you don't know. You know, maybe you need to wait a while. You don't know until you seek the Lord. So David asked the question, shall I pursue after this troop? Go ahead. Shall I overtake them? And shall I overtake them? What was the answer? And he answered him, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David got the message back from the Lord. You're going to overtake them and you're going to get everything back. So this terrible day is going to end good the next day. It's going to end good. Actually, they're going to get a blessing out of it because as we find out, they're not going to just get their stuff back. They're going to take all of the people's stuff since they didn't came and messed around with the wrong people. They're going to take us. David and his boys was killers. They killed for a living, but they still was right because the Bible, you say, well, how do they kill us? You know, look, the Bible says it's a time to kill. It's a time to heal. It's a time for everything. And this was that time. Go ahead, verse 7. Nine. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him. Uh-huh, 600. That means all these brothers, whoever had families, their families was gone in an instant. 600 of them. Go ahead. And came to the brook Besor, mm -hmm. where those that were left behind stayed. Uh-huh, some of them stayed. 200 of them. He going to tell you verse 10. But David pursued. He and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over to the brook to be so. See, they couldn't even make it. They just, look, we can't go no farther. We didn't went as far as we can go. So that was cool. You know, look, y'all just sit here and keep an eye on the stuff, and we're going to go see if we can find them. Verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water. Uh -huh. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. Uh -huh. For he had eaten no bread nor drank any water three days and three nights. Mm -hmm. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? Mm -hmm. And whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days are gone I fell six. Mm -hmm. Sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites, Cherethites and mm -hmm. upon the coast which belonged to Judah uh -huh. and upon the south of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. Okay, so now he was with the people that sacked David's town. He was with them. Go ahead. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear to me by God that thou would, not, thou would neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And I'll bring thee down to this company. So, of course, he know where they at. So he can show them where, exactly where they at. He said, as long as you don't kill me. And, of course, David, David is, 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 is able to promise him that long as he fulfill his end. Verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking mm -hmm. and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. Now they partying. They, they having a good time. They like, look, we didn't came up. We took all their stuff. But hey, God is with David. David and his men, they serve as God. They trying to do right by God. So ultimately, God going to look out for him, even though he put him, he let him get in this situation. And this was definitely a trying of their faith. So now they sitting down there partying, thinking, you know, it's over with. They should have known better, but they didn't. Go ahead. And David smote them from the twilight, even until the evening of the next day. See, David, his boys, they didn't play at all. It wasn't just taking some stuff. Look, y'all won't never come back to do this again. David smote them. From the twilight even until the evening of the next day. They did some killing. Go ahead. And there escaped not a man of them. Uh-huh. Say 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. So some of them fled away. Now, 400 fled away, but young ones. But David, it's only 400 with them, but they killed all the rest of the people. Go ahead. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. But more importantly, 
they got everything, all their stuff back. So this just become like a bad dream. You done lost everything, you crying till you can't cry no more, and the next day you know you got something to really praise the Lord about because you got it all back. You got it all back. And actually more. See, sometimes the Lord got to send you through some stuff so he can bless you. That's the only way you're going to get to the door where the blessing is. You got to go through some fire or something. That's exactly what happened here. So they got all their stuff back. What else? And David rescued his two wives. Uh-huh. And there was nothing lacking to them. They didn't lose nothing. Go ahead. Neither small nor great. So when the Lord then put you in a situation like that and you still come out unscathed, you know that's the Lord. You ain't, cut, you ain't lost nothing. All that was testing your faith because you didn't lose nothing in it. Go ahead. Neither sons nor daughters, uh -huh. neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. Go ahead. David recovered all. He recovered all. And then some. Go ahead. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before those other cattle and uh -huh. said, this is David's spoil. Okay, so they took all the people's stuff and said, this is David's spoil. And he's sharing it with, with everybody. The one same one they want to kill. Now they like, Lay, all right, you the man. You was right. The Lord's still with you. Go ahead. <laughs> and David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could and, not and follow this, David. And this is another way let you know this is our people because we're going to find something to argue about at the best time. You just thought you lost your whole family. You should just be thankful to get your stuff back and you getting some more. But notice what they going. He got to the 200 men that was left. Go ahead. Whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. Uh -huh. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. Uh -huh. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. He saluted them because they still on our side. Go ahead. Then answered all the wicked men and the men of Belial. You know, you got, you got some wicked people. It's 400 of them. You know you got some bad in there. That's the way it is. That's just the nature of the beast. So some of the people with David, they got some concerns because they greedy now. You just went from losing everything. Now you got something you want to argue about. So, of course, their issue is them 200 don't get nothing. Don't get them nothing. <laughs> they get their stuff back. That's it. Give them what's there. That's it. They ain't getting no extras. <laughs> that's Israel for you all. Go ahead. And the wicked men and the men of Belial of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them out of the spoil that we had recovered. Uh -huh, we ain't giving them none of that because they didn't come with us. Goodness. Go ahead. Save to every man his wife and his children that they may lead them away and depart. Hey, they can just take their wife and their children back. We're going to give them that back. That's it. Go ahead. Then said David, ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who have preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hands. Right. You got to think about the Lord. The Lord didn't bless you. you. You trying to step on somebody else's neck. Think about what the Lord did for you and be generous. That's what you're supposed to do. Be generous. They still on our team. They couldn't make it. They, 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 they served the function because they were sure they was able to leave stuff with them. They didn't have to carry all this stuff. Y'all stay right here by the stuff and we're going to go handle the business. So they still serve their function. Go ahead. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? Uh-huh. But as this part is that goeth down to battle. As his battle, so what? So shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. So shall they all going to get a share. The same share that you went to the battle, that's good. That's what you needed to do. They stayed by the stuff. They on our side, too. They going to get the equal share. That's it. Shut up. That's what David had to tell them. Go ahead. They shall part alike. They shall part alike. Go ahead. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. But now it got so good. It started off so bad. It got so good. Now we got something to argue about now. About how to cheat somebody out of something. But that's a, that's a, that's a, a living color example on how things went from being bad, terrible, to being a blessing. It was, it was a blessing in disguise all along. Let's go back to, uh, let's go to Psalm 105. Because we're going to read about Joseph, but we're going to set it up with Psalms because Psalms had already rehearsed the matter. Psalm 105 and pick it up at verse 16. Go ahead, read it. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. He sent the man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. 
whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Okay, so the word of the Lord will try you, brothers and sisters. Joseph went through all kind of drama, hadn't did nothing wrong, even had hatred from his own brothers. Let's show you Israel is something else. And got sold into slavery, ended up in prison, hadn't done nothing to deserve, none of that. But he kept his mind right. And that's the key, whatever you're dealing with. Can you keep your mind right and stayed on God? Because that's what's at play is to see if you could get off track. That's what the goal is. And what we got to realize, serving God and getting into his kingdom is bigger than anything you're experiencing right now. It's bigger than that. So don't get sidetracked. That's what we read earlier. He said, you going to reap if you don't faint. But that's the challenge, not to faint. So Joseph, I'm talking about, we cry. I've talked to brothers that's in prison. They done done something to be there. They could play, oh, man, they do me so bad. I mean, my brother, I'm telling you, I'm up here. I'm in the belly of the beast, brother. I'm in the belly of the beast. These heathen mission. I'd be like, brother, did, did, you, did you do something by the way? Was you guilty? Yeah, you know, I did it, but, you know, still. <laughs> I'm like, dude. But here's a brother Joseph, who didn't do nothing, he didn't do anything, and he in the belly of the beast, but he not crying about it. When you are serving God, you learn whatever situation God's got you in, he got you in it, make the best out of that situation. Then he can put you in a better situation, because he controls it. We got to remember God is controlling it. So that's what it's telling you. It said they, they put his feet in fetters, and they heard him. And it said, the word of the Lord tried him. What verse you at now? 20. 105, Psalm 105 and 20. Read it. The king sent and loosed him. Now the king let him out of prison when they needed him. Because the Lord would make the right people need you at, at certain times. Go ahead. Even the ruler of the people. Uh -huh. and, and let him go free. And let him go free. He had did nothing to be locked up. But he was locked up and kept his faith. Go ahead. He made him lord of his house uh -huh. and ruler of all his substance. Now he lord of his house. He put Joseph in charge of everything because the Lord was blessing Joseph. But he had to go through the bad stuff. Go ahead. To bind his princes at his pleasure uh -huh. and teach his senators wisdom. Joseph was the one charged with doing that. What else happened? Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. See, and that's how the Israelites got into Egypt because Joseph was running it and he was able to take care of him because that's what the... See, it's much bigger. The Lord is dealing with everybody and too many times we're looking at our own little personal position and thing. Let's go to Genesis and look at it. Since they told us already what happened, we're going to look at it in real time. Genesis 37 and 3. Genesis 37 and 3. And you got to deal with you got to deal with sometimes people hating you for no reason. Job had to deal with his friends accusing him for no reason. Hadn't done nothing. Deal with it. Keep it moving. Resist hitting somebody in the mouth. Because that's what Satan to try to get you to do. Then he can say, see, look at it. He messed up. Genesis 37 and 3. Read it. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Uh-huh. Because he was the son of his old age. Uh-huh. And he made him a coat of many colors. So, jo is, is, Jacob, which is Israel, his name was changed Israel. He was partial to a Jake, uh, Joseph. But that's his right to handle things how he handled it. And more importantly, God was actually had some special plans for Joseph as well. So jo uh, Jacob wasn't by himself. But the thing is, people around you sometimes get jealous for no reason. They don't have nothing to do with it. But notice this. Let's see what happened. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, uh -huh. they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, they hated Joseph. Even if you want to say Jacob is wrong, for, you know, paying a little more attention to Joseph, which really he not. That's his right, really. That's his right. And, you know, and different kids need different things. So, but if anything, Joseph hadn't done nothing. <laughs> he didn't do nothing. His father made him a coat. You know, what you mad at me for? <laughs> but that's the way flesh is. And then the Lord, the Lord blessed him like we're going to find out he had some dreams. The Lord was showing him. So the Lord was with Joseph. But we got people around us that will be hating when they see the Lord is with you. See, haters been around. We think that's something new. 
Oh, I got all these haters. Haters been around. And hating for no reason. Again, Joseph hadn't done nothing. But it said right here, when his brother saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they, I'm sure he loved them too. But yeah, he catered a little more to Joseph, and the Lord had some special plans for Joseph. They hated him, and they couldn't even speak peacefully to him. And this they own brother. Instead of being happy with praise, because you, you, you know, the Lord going to have you do great stuff. That's what you probably should look at. Maybe that's from the Lord. What would have been wrong with them saying that? Man, I see the Lord is with that brother. But see, people, we can't say that because it's that flesh. Man, the Lord is with our brother. Go ahead. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it his brethren. What did he do that for? But it's from the Lord. <laughs> it's from the Lord. You talking about some hate, some more coming. Go ahead. And they hated him yet the more. And they hated him yet the more. Go ahead. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Mm -hmm. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Mm -hmm. And lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. Uh -huh. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. Uh -huh. He said, y'all sheaves bowed down to my sheep. That was a dream. And he had the dream. <laughs> He told it with some emphasis, too. Like, hey, God gave it to him, though. That's how it is. Oh, they couldn't stand him. Go ahead. They gave him name. They said, oh, this is weak, this dreamer. Here come the dreamer. Go ahead. And his brethren said to him, shall thou indeed reign over us? He said, what you trying to say? You a young whippersnapper. You going to reign over us? What you talking about, boy? Go ahead. Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? Uh-huh. Go ahead. And they hated him yet the more And for they his hated dream. him yet the more for his dream, which coming from God. That's what I say. You don't want to hate somebody when God is doing something with them. You don't want to do that. That's a problem. Especially when you see God is doing something with them. Maybe they don't see it yet. But he's not making up the dreams. But go ahead. What verse yet? 18. Okay, yeah. Skip to verse 18 to save a little time. Go ahead. And when they saw him afar off. Now that Joseph later on time went past and the father sent Joseph out there to check on him. They was out doing some work. So as he got close and found out where they was at, he got close to him. They saw him afar off. They started scheming on him already. This is your own brother. So you Israel can be trifling. This is the 12 sons of Jacob with 10 of them really that's really going to do Joseph in. Go ahead. Even before he came near unto them, Go ahead. they conspired against him to slay him. Now, first of all, you going to kill your brother for Is it that serious, really? You getting ready to kill the brother. That show you we something else. You wonder why we kill each other now. And we try to blame. That's, that make me sick. Israel want to blame the white man. It's the white man fault. They got us hate. Nick, I want to say, you've been hating yourself. <laughs> you've been hating yourself. You can't blame nobody for that. They was hating on Joseph here. Wasn't a white man around. Jealousy. That's the nature of the beast. People will go that way. So they hating. They talking about let's kill him. He haven't done nothing. The father catered to him and the Lord gave him some dreams. Where's his fault at in that? But now he getting ready. He need to die. Go ahead. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer coming. This dreamer coming. Go ahead. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him uh -huh. and cast him in some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast has devoured him. Now you're going to lie. Go ahead. And we shall see what will become of his dream. And we're going to see what happened with them dreams. But one thing about it, what the Lord got planned, there ain't nothing nobody can do about it. That's the good thing. That's why you, you don't even have to push. You don't have to knock nobody over. You don't have to rush to the front. Because the Lord going to hide you where he wants you at no matter what. Go ahead. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Reuben had some sense. He was the oldest. Reuben thinking like, dude, we, we can't kill our brother. He is our brother. I don't, I'm a little salty about the situation, but we cannot kill him. So Reuben, he, you know, and the Lord always has somebody get in the gap. So he said, well, we can't kill him. Go ahead. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood. Shed no blood, but what? But cast him into this pit that uh, is in the wilderness. Uh-huh. And lay no hand upon him that uh, he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. See, Reuben trying to say, but they bent now. So really it wasn't no, it wasn't no really talking sense into them totally like saying, look, he don't need to die. He just said, look, just don't kill him. We'll put him in the pit. He's going to die anyway. But we don't need to lay our hand on him. 
let what happened what happen. So he's trying to get him away from him. Like, we just put him in the pit. I, he thinking to himself, I go back and get him out the pit later. I get to that bridge when it come. But they listen to him. Because still, he's going to die in the pit if don't nothing happen. Go ahead. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. Well, they didn't like that coat, did they? All over coat. And now you got brothers out here taking gym shoes. You know we don't know God now. Nah, that's You get killed over anything. Go ahead. His coat of many colors that was on him. But really, it's jealousy. Because they didn't nobody really want the coat. They just didn't want him to have a coat. Go ahead. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Go ahead. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked. This is some bad stuff, brothers and sisters, happened to this brother. But we saw the outcome. He went through all of this. Even got in prison. Because they're going to sell him into Egypt. Got in prison in Egypt. Woman tried to commit adultery. He wouldn't do it. She lied on him. He in prison. Still not bitter. Still making the best of his situation. And the Lord going to bless him. Next thing you know, he ruling the whole country. And his brother's going to have to come down there and bow down like the Lord has showed. That show you, boy, the Lord got a sense of humor, don't he? Go ahead. And they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, uh -huh. going to carry it down into Egypt. Go ahead. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit, if he, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Uh-huh. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not, let not our hand be upon him. Go ahead. For he is our brother in our flesh. Oh, nah, that come to mind. He our brother in our flesh. But the only thing at play here is we can get some money off of him. So we might, what's up? Why are we going to kill him? We can sell this dude and make some money off of this deal. Yeah, Israel, something else. Go ahead. And his brother were content. So they were content. See, Reuben not there either, by the way. Reuben gone. Matter of fact, he going... He's going to go back, come back around to get him out the pit, and he's going to be gone. Go ahead. Then there passed by many a nice merchantman, merchant and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. See, they sold him. Sold their own brother for no good reason. Got 20 pieces of silver. Go ahead. As a matter of fact, read 29 just to show you where Reuben, because Reuben had intent to get him out the pit anyway. He was sneaking around and going to come back and save him and take him back home. Verse 29. Yeah. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. So they sold. That's how he ended up in Egypt, which he, he needed to be. The Lord wanted that. See, the Lord wanted to get you somewhere. Sometimes how he gets you there is not pretty. Go ahead. And Reuben returned into the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And he rent his clothes because he think they done killed him. He was going to get him out the pit anyway. But they came up with another bright idea. Let's sell him. See, he don't even know what happened. Go ahead. Keep reading. And they, oh. And 30, he returned, 31. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, 30, yeah. My fault. And, return, and he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not, and I, where shall I go? He said, the child is not. But they, they obviously had to tell him, no, we sold him. He okay. We just sold him. We made some money off of him. Here go your portion. But now, I'm assuming that's what happened. Really don't say after that. But now, skip to verse 36. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar. See, the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar. Go ahead. And officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Okay. Now, we, we saw the story in Psalm that he ended up in jail in Egypt, and he ended up coming out ruling. Pharaoh made him second in command. He made him second in command only under Pharaoh. Wasn't nobody higher in Egypt than Joseph, but look at what he had to go through. So that's why the title is all things, even bad things, work together for good. Let's move on. Go to uh, Genesis 50. Go to Genesis 50. Because you know they eventually, they had to stand before Joseph. They bowed down. And then they, would, they figured they were straight while the old man was living. Because the old man came down there. They said, Joseph is a lie. They done made up a lie like he got killed and all that stuff. He found out Joseph was a lie. He was obviously happy to see him, and Joseph saved him from the famine. Now, at 50 is when Jacob died, and they worried now because, you know, that's how, that's how siblings would be. They say, you know, I might not get you back while mom and daddy's still around. Wait, when mom and daddy leave, I'm going to get y'all <laughs> Because jo Joseph was calling it. He was the boss. 
And they was concerned because they know they had did them wrong. Uh, 50 and verse 14, read it. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father. See, they buried their father in Canaan. Then they went back to Egypt because that's where they live. Go ahead. After he had buried his father. Uh huh. That show you Egypt and the promised land, Canaan, all of them was black people lands. The Egyptians, all that's Africa. What we call Africa now is the land of Ham. Egypt's land, the Canaanites, that's Ham's son. All of them was black people. And Israel inherited Canaan's land. So it's, it's not a big deal, but it's just a fact that the people of the Bible, they were black. So they returned into Egypt after they went to Canaan to bury their father. And verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph would peradventure hate us. Uh -huh. and he was certainly required of us all the evil which we did unto him. See, they know they did evil to him, and they worry now. That's the thing. You do some dirt, now you got to worry about it coming back. And now they said, look, daddy dead. He going to get us. <laughs> he going to get us. They, they got to come up with something quick. Because they know they in trouble. Go ahead. And they sent a messenger to Joseph. They sent a mess. They ain't even want to go talk to him. They sent a messenger to Joseph. You know, this is what daddy said. <laughs> go ahead. Thy father did command before he died, saying, uh -huh. So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren oh, and this, their this sin. Oh, this is from the dead father. He see, but he said it before he died now. He said, Forgive your brother. Well, why wouldn't he tell him that? <laughs> That would have been the person to tell. So forgive your brethren the trespass of your brethren and their sin, for they did what? For they did unto the evil. So they did evil to you, which is true. They admitting they did it. Go ahead. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. Uh-huh. And Joseph wept, wept when they spake unto him. So Joseph cried. That's, that's the type of guy Joseph was. He felt bad, but go ahead. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, uh -huh. Behold, we be thy servants. Just like them dreams said. They, they, they said, look, we your servants. You run it. Because he run in Egypt. Ain't nothing they could say. Go ahead. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. Now, this is the type of man Joseph is. He telling them, look, don't worry about it. Go ahead. For am I in the place of God? He said, look, I ain't the one to take vengeance on y'all. Do I'm not God. God going to handle it. And that's the attitude you need to have. Look, God can handle what people got coming. All thing you got to worry about is doing you. And everything else going to fall into place. God can. He said, am I in the place of God? I'm not God. Hey, y'all did some bogus stuff. I know. But hey, that's between y'all and God. I'm good. The Lord took care of me. I'm y'all boss. Matter of fact, go do something. Because <laughs> he running it. So, you know, but see, sometimes if your mind not right, now you're going to take advantage and you're going to get them back. Then God going to deal with you now. But go ahead. But as for you, you thought evil against me. See, he said, he, he know it. He said, I know y'all thought evil against me, but what about God? What about God? Go ahead. But God meant it unto good. But God meant it unto good. This is exactly what we're talking about. All things, even bad things, work together for good. And this is what Joseph understood. He said, yeah, y'all meant some bogus stuff. But see, it turned out good, though. God meant it unto good. Go ahead. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. To save much people alive. Okay, good. Flip over to uh, John 11. We're going to get to the ultimate example on some bad stuff happening, even from evil people who mean to do evil, but it still turn out good. This is what we got to look at, how life works like that. Even the thing that we all heard, people don't pay attention to concerning Jesus, brothers and sisters. Because I've been hearing everybody say forever, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus died for us. Oh, he died for us. Isn't that one of you died? But what people don't, reg what don't register with people is that he didn't just simply die, brothers and sisters. Some Crazy people killed him. That's how he died. So he had to deal with that. That some crazy people wanted him dead and killed him. So they meant evil, but God did mean it for good, like Joseph just said. Look at this in John 11. John 11. Because even this king said it. He said the right thing for the wrong reason. John 11 and 47. Read it. 
Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. See, Jesus was getting on their nerve. He's doing all these miracles. He's preaching the truth, which is really showing if you lied and you've been lying for a long time, and somebody come along preaching the truth, that's going to shine a light on all your lies. That's what Jesus was doing. And they hated him. So these, these religiously, see, you got to understand, religious people had Jesus killed. They hated Jesus. It wasn't somebody out in the street. Just like what we doing, preaching the truth out the Bible, them the last people we got to worry about people in the street. We're going to have to worry about some of them people in the church. Them the ones going to be mad because you making them look bad in front of people they've been lying to. So that's what they said. They said, we, what are we going to do? This man doing so many miracles and everybody listening to him, they, he messing our good thing up. Go ahead. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Uh-huh. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. See, in other words, we ain't going to be good for nothing. They're going to take away everything that, that we've been working hard to keep because it's all about their stuff is all they're concerned with. Keep reading. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, uh -huh. nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, uh -huh. and that the whole nation perish not. So the chief priest, you know, he, he, was, he was the big boss. He just hit the nail on the head. He said, look, y'all talking in circles. Y'all don't know. This, this is serious. We need to kill him. But see, it sound like he meaning good. It sound like, do you know he, somebody got to die for the nation? No. He mean we need to kill him so we can keep our good thing going. See, that's what preachers worried about. They lying to people, getting paid, making money. Hey, they want to get rid of somebody that's making them look bad. Like preachers preaching tithes and, uh, you know, the only law they want to preach is tithes while they say all the law done away with. That's an insult to tithes. Look, why did that's the only thing you keep it? But this is the same thing here. They looking bad, brothers and sisters. So he don't mean it in a good way. He's an evil man that's worried about his position that he holds and don't want to lose it. He's saying, we run this nation. It's, we got to get rid of this guy. He's a thorn in our side. That's what he's saying. But it, sound, it actually was the truth because the flip side, God got a good plan going to come out of this. All things work together for good. So that's what he said. He said, y'all don't know nothing of y'all. Y'all going back and forth with this thing. Don't you consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people that the whole nation perish not? He just mean what they running. That's really what he mean. Notice what the writer said here. Go ahead. And this spake he not of himself. See, he didn't speak it of himself. In other words, he didn't have good intentions behind that statement. But he actually told the truth. <laughs> Sometimes even a mule catch a fly when his mouth open. That's why some people say, well, I seen the pastor. He said something true. Duh. Yeah, he should say something true once in a while. That don't mean his overall message is true. Go ahead. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. See, he, he, he accidentally prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, even though he was talking about we just need to kill the guy. He was talking from his perspective. See, and the writer is, is inserting this. Go ahead. And not that for that nation only. Now, the writer is talking. Now, it wasn't that guy. That guy didn't say all of this. Go ahead. But that also he should gather together in one that the children of God that was scattered abroad. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. See, they trying to put him to death for their reasons. Evil people trying to put Jesus to death. Just like what Joseph's brothers did to him was evil. They was being evil when they did that to him, but it turned out good. Go ahead. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. He know they're trying to kill him. Go ahead. But with this unto a country near to the wilderness. He started dipping on them. He said, look, they, they mad. They mad. They hating. They drinking that haterade. Go ahead. Into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. And he continued with his disciples. Flip over to Acts 2 now, and we're going we to get the true story on how Jesus died and by whom. We're going to get the true story. Acts 2. Because you might think, well, the man did tell the truth. Yeah, he told the truth for the wrong reason. Because we're going to see what that was really about. And it's, it revolves back to the lesson that people doing bad stuff and God bringing good out of it. 
That's how awesome God is. God don't have to change the landscape. He don't have to make everybody good. God said, for those that love me and do right, I'm going to make it good no matter what it look like. No matter how it happened, I'm going to make it good for them because they trust me. Acts 2 and 22. Acts 2 and 22. Read it. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders. Now, this is after he died and resurrected and went back to heaven. So, Peter is telling the people about it. Ye men of Israel. Notice that's who he's preaching to, Israel. Ye men of Israel. Because Israel were the first followers of Jesus because that's all he preached to. Other people didn't come on board till much later. It's for everybody. But it's do start with Israel. That's why he talks to you. This is what people don't understand. And we like we Israel, the church of Jesus. People walk past, think we crazy, but they see a church, say the Baptist church. They say, oh, yeah, I'm going there. But Israel seen foreign to people nowadays, but it's throughout the whole Bible. So he said, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him. In the midst of you as what? As ye yourselves also know. And what happened? Go ahead. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Here's a plan by God. He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That means it was pre-planned. It was determined well in advance. Go ahead. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But who did it? You Wicked people. Wicked people killed Jesus. That's what people have missed, that whole message there. Wicked people killed. People say he died. I say, how he died? The people act like he just laid down and went to sleep and died. No, you need to understand wicked people killed him because that's the way the world is made up. Wicked people didn't like him. He said, ye have taken him by wicked hands. And he's talking to the Israelites because though they sent him to the Romans to crucify him, they did it. They had him killed. Like David didn't kill, he committed adultery with the man's wife, which was his, the one main sin that the Lord charged him with. But he didn't kill the man when the woman got pregnant. He sent him out there, and the Ammonites killed him. He put him on the front. But the Lord said, you killed him, even though David didn't touch him. So the Israelites had him killed, brothers and sisters. That's why he said, ye, he talking to Israel. He ain't even bringing the Romans in who actually nailed him to the tree. They did it. They're going to pay for that. But the Israelites got their part for delivering him up. It said, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But what about God? Go ahead. Whom God has raised up. But God raised him up because it's going to end good. Go ahead. Having loosed the pains of death. That's right. Go ahead. Because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. And see, and that death give us a chance to live. Because he had to die. But how did he die? Some evil stuff went on. Skip down to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the same Jesus whom ye had crucified, both Lord and Christ. See, the ones y'all crucified the Lord and raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ. So now we can have faith and get redeemed from our sins. Because he died. Go ahead. Now, when they have heard this, they were pricked in their heart uh -huh. and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles. What they say? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Uh, now, they want to know what they, they know. We, look, we messed up. What do we need to do to fix this matter? Go ahead. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins. Mm -hmm. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, all that started with some wicked people killing Jesus. But now we can get salvation. Let's show you how awesome God is. Let's go first. We're going to wrap it up. Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. So we need to accept the bad stuff. We need to, you know, kind of like my daughter used to say, she was real young. She's getting old now. She's 15. But when she was about 7 or 8, she was saying, you know, something bad happened. She said, I just embrace it. Because you can't do nothing about it. You just got to deal with it. That's what we need to do, because once you embrace it, then you can overcome. You can take away the power from it and know it's not all of that. Notice this, and use it to do good. Hebrews 5 and verse 5, concerning Jesus again. See, Jesus went through it worse than all of us. 
Hebrews 5 and 5. Read it. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. Uh-uh. Go ahead. But he said unto him, Thou art my son. Today have I begotten thee. See, that was from the Father. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee was ultimately when he came out the grave. That's another lesson. <clears throat> but skip the same time because he's still talking about Christ. But he's going to show you how Christ channeled the grief and the obstruction that he went through from Man, now this dude was God and became man, and he had to deal with people acting crazy against him. It's hard for us to deal with, man. We come from dirt. Somebody act crazy, you, you be ready to do something. That's why we not at a point where we really ready to be like God. That's what we working toward. Because he was God, and he, he, it was time for him to just take it. He let them kill him. He, could, he told Peter, I can pray right now. My father sent me some angels like that. Hey. This will be over with. But I got to follow the scripture. Go ahead, verse 8. Though he were a son. Though he were a son, Jesus, go ahead. Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. This is what we need to do, brothers and sisters. We need to let the bad stuff induce us to follow God even harder. Stay closer with God. That's what you need. That's what it's telling you Jesus did. See, Sometimes we won't do right unless the Lord puts some drama on us. He said, though he were a son, even though he was already right, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Go ahead. And being made perfect. And he came out that grave. He was perfect. Go ahead. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Not just have faith. Faith without works is dead unto all them that obey him. That's that's what it all boils down to. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 12 now. We're wrapping it up. Hebrews 12. Because we saw countless examples, even the ultimate example of Jesus having bad stuff happen that turns out for good for everybody. See, God is looking at the big picture. It's bigger than us individually. So now with those examples in mind is what he's going to tell you here. We can run the race and deal with whatever we got to deal with. Hebrews 12 and 1, read it. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We got all kind of examples, and we just looked at a few in this lesson. We looked at Joseph. We looked at Job. We looked at David and his people. We looked at Jesus himself. That's a few examples on bad stuff happening to them, but they stayed encouraged with their God. That's what we got to get used to. We need to be prepared. God will have you in that position. A lot of times people keep ending up in the same position, but there's a saying about that. Maybe you haven't learned what you need to learn in that position. Wherefore, seeing we also can pass about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us do what then? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. See, people say, well, Jesus died. You don't have to do nothing. The Bible begs to differ. Jesus died by now, by the time he writing this. But he said, since we got this, these examples, this cloud of wit, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily trip you up. Beset us. Go ahead and let us do what? And let us run with patience uh -huh. the race that is set before us. That's right. Run with patience. You're going to need some patience. Go ahead. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. The, the prime example. We have some others. The theme is throughout the Bible, but he's the prime example of what? The author and finisher of our faith. And what did he do? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured being nailed to a tree. He endured that, knowing that he had a better reward coming. Go ahead. Despising the shame. Uh -huh. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what should we consider about this whole scenario? Go ahead. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Back to you faint. But you got examples that, that you can hold on to. Consider him. Like, even when you have opposition, you try to preach the word, people come arguing with you. Even some of my family be arguing with See, they don't argue with me no more. Once they got beat down with the Bible enough, if my family left it alone, some of them joined and some of them said, don't talk to him about the Bible no more because he's going to win that battle. So, but that's when you have that. Jesus even had people in his family didn't like what he was doing initially. So, like even Job had those men come along and contradict and act like he was out of pocket. So the Bible is telling you, you're going to have that. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself. 
you should consider him because what happened to you, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. You can faint with the stuff around you. Don't let the stuff around you make you faint. Make that, use that to focus on God more. Go ahead, verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto blood. See, we ain't got to the point we have resisted unto blood to do what? Striving against sin. See, people done died for the word. You just might go through a little issue over here. But now, let's wrap it up. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. This is one of the favorite scriptures that people have quoted for years. But they, like, men, like many of them, they take it out of context. Most people have heard it. And the main one here is when he says, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. But see, people, are, when they have quoted this over the years, I've seen people go to church, quoted it. It's always trying to do something big and good and magnificent. It's never looking at it the flip side, which is really what he's intending for you to do. Look at it the flip side. If you could do all things, that means you can go through some stuff too. Joseph did all things. He went to prison. He was sold by his brother. He handled that. That's the kind of stuff he getting to. Like I said, it's easier to handle the good times than it is the bad times. Philippians 4 and 10. Go ahead, read it. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Uh-huh. Wherein ye were also care careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Uh-huh. Not that I speak the respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. See, Paul said, I'm glad that you're trying to look out for me, because that's just some fruit to show that you trusting in the Lord. You're trying to look out for me. Then he went further to say, but I'm not saying I'm happy that you're looking out for me just because I'm desirous or I want something. I'm saying it because that's the thing you need to be doing. So that's what he said, verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. Why he don't respect the inspector one? Because he said, I have learned in what? That whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And this is what we need to do. Whatever the situation is, we there be content. The Lord is in control. He can make it better, or he can leave you there for a while, whatever it is. He, Paul said, I've learned this. This is what many of us haven't learned. He said, I, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, whatever the predicament is, therewith to be content. So he said, I'm not asking, I'm not asking for nothing because I'm not content. That's the thing you need to do. Go ahead, verse 12. I know both how to be a base. And I know how to abound. He said, I know how to be low on the low end, and I know how to be up high. I know both. See, that's what I'm saying. We need to balance it. That's why I even include in the title, even though the scripture didn't say bad things, I include in the title of the lesson because that's the gist of it. All things, even bad things, work together for good. You got to be able to handle the bad stuff without fame. You got to be able to handle it. This is what Paul said. See, now you're going to get to the full understanding of what he mean when he said, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Because the hardest thing to do is when the bad stuff happens. That's the hardest. So like I said, if I go home today, it's not going to happen. I'm going to tell you. But if I go home and it's a million dollar check in my mailbox, we're going to take care of that. It ain't really going to, you know, I'm sure I'm going to have all y'all right over there. <laughs> Look, we're going to help you with that, Brother Elijah. <laughs> we know what to do with that. I got somebody you can talk to. <laughs> but the bottom line, that's not going to be the most difficult thing to handle. The most difficult thing to handle, if I go home and it's a foreclosure note there and all of that, <laughs> now ain't nobody going to show up either. Everybody going to be like, we're going to pray for you, brother. <laughs> So that's the thing, that's, that's the harder thing to handle. And this is what he's, this is what he's getting to. So he's not, because people have used that scripture, I can do all things through Christ that's strengthening me, you know, and they talking about getting a house, getting a car, they talking about all of a sudden, I, I, I can get that promotion. I can do all things through Christ that's strengthening me. But what about suffering something? Can you do that? What about just stop eating pork? I can't do that. 
That's too hard. That law too hard. Well, you just said all things. Wouldn't that be included? That's what I'm saying. So people don't mean what they're saying. Go ahead, verse 12 again. I'm sorry. I know both how to be a base and I know how to abound. That's right. Go ahead. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both, both to be full. Both how to be full and what? And to be hungry. I can handle, I know how to deal with both of them. Be full and hungry. Go ahead. Both to abound and to suffer need. Both to abound and suffer need. Then you get to the famous verse. Verse 13. I can do all things through Christ with strength. In Is he just talking about some big, amazing stuff? He, told, he said all things, brothers and sisters. I can take the bad with the good. I know how to do it because I trust in God. That's what he's talking about. People just take it out of kind of go to Lamentations 3. We're almost done. Lamentations 3. And even when the bad stuff happens, we got to channel that where it make us want to obey God that much more. Back to the Old Testament. Lamentations, right after Jeremiah, Lamentations 3, verse 25 through 32. Then we're going to read 39 to 40. Lamentations 3 and 25. Go ahead, read it. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. Go ahead. To the soul that seeketh him. Uh-huh. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And that includes woman too, to hope and quietly wait. If you complain in every step of the way, that's not quietly, but anyway, go ahead. It is good for a man that he bear his, the yoke in his mouth. I'm it, oh, sorry, yoke in, in his, his youth. youth. Uh-huh, go ahead. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. Uh-huh. He put his mouth in the dust. See, it's good to suffer a little bit. We, we, that sounds kind of crazy, but you need it. And you need to use it the right way and not let it throw you off. Go ahead. If so be, there may be hope. Uh huh. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. Even Jesus did that, but go ahead. He is filled full with reproach. Uh huh. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Uh huh. But though he cause grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercy. And that's what you had to trust in the Lord for. But to sum it up, skip to verse 39, and this is what he's going to tell you. Go ahead. Wherefore does a living man complain? See, we complain too much. We complain, complain, complain. He said, wherefore doth a living man complain instead of waiting quietly for the Lord to hear your prayer and answer? Go ahead. A man for the punishment of his sin. And a lot of times you got to go through something because you have committed some sin. Even it could be down the road, the Lord just gets you later. So wherefore doth a living man, that includes woman too. You woman can't get away from it because woman is mankind. Wherefore doth the living man complain, a man, for the punishment of his sin? What should we do? Verse 40. Let us search and try our ways. Let us search and try our ways. A lot of times we point the finger at everybody but ourselves. Let us search and try our ways. Go ahead. And turn again to the Lord. That's right. Let's go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 59. And we're going to skip a little bit to say something. Psalm 119 and 59. So it sounds crazy to say it's good to go through a little <clears throat> suffering, some bad stuff. But it is because that'll help clean you up and perfect you. Psalm 119 and 59. 119 and 59. Read it when you get it. I thought on my ways uh -huh. and turned my feet unto thy testimony. This is what we need to do. God will let stuff happen so we can get our act together. You be wondering why stuff happening. God trying to get your attention. God don't always talk smoothly to you. He will put a little hurt on you to get your attention. And it, you should do this. He said, I thought on my ways. But we're going to see, brothers and sisters, what makes the average man or woman think on their way. If everything is going good for you, you ain't going to take time to think on your ways. You're going to be like, I ain't, well, I ain't got to worry about nothing. It's good. Everything cool. <laughs> but let something bad happen. You're like, wait a minute, what's going on? Hey, I ain't doing something right. And that's what the Lord do. I thought on my ways and I turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Where verse 60. I made haste uh -huh. and delayed not to keep thy commandments. I made haste. Sometimes when the Lord put some drama on you, I seen people reluctant and kicking. Yeah, I think I'm going to come. I'm going to try to listen. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. Loosely. The Lord started. I see the Lord just out of nowhere. Bam. They be like, I got to get over there. I'm over there. <laughs> it's like they urge it all of a sudden. 
That's what the Lord will do. Because you think tomorrow is guaranteed and all that, the Lord will show you it's not. He said, I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. What happened? The bands of the wicked have robbed me. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but what? But I have not forgotten thy law. Is that, look at that. You still got to serve the Lord. You can't get caught up on what the wicked doing, even if they did it to you. If there's nothing you can do about it, there's nothing you can do about it. If you can address it, fine, that's okay. David addressed it, didn't he? He prayed and sought the Lord, and he addressed it when the bands of the wicked robbed him. But the bottom line, you can't forget the law. You can't forget to serve God. Skip to say time to verse 66 now. Go ahead. Teach me good judgment and knowledge. Uh-huh. For I have believed thy commandments. Go ahead. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Uh-huh. But now have I kept thy word. See, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So what made him start to keep the word? That affliction, that bad stuff. See, it's good. That bad stuff will do you good. Go ahead. Thou art good uh -huh. and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Go ahead. The proud have forged a lie against me. See, proud come against your lying like even Job's friends lied on him. Go ahead. But I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Verse 70. Their heart is as fat as the grease. Uh-huh. But I delight in thy law. Now, this is going to sum it all up, brothers and sisters. 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. See, he said it's good that I went through some bad trouble. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. That put something on my mind, made me turn and start doing right. And what does 72 say? The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. You need to tell them prosperity preachers that. They doing away with the law and preaching about some money. Something not right with that. That's not balance at all. Romans 8, where we started at. Now we back to where we started at, and everybody should have a full understanding of exactly what it means, because we done went through the gamut on the Bible telling us and showing us examples on how all things, even bad things, work for good if you on God's side. That's the key. Romans 8 and 28 again, but we're going to read it through and show you that I wasn't wrong for inserting that in the title, even bad things, even though it didn't say that in that verse. I know what the implication is. Because we didn't read the story all the way through. Romans 8 and 28. Go ahead. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's a great statement, isn't it? And he's saying all to encompass even the bad stuff. Go ahead. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh-huh. Go ahead. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. It's just a matter of time. That's what we on our way somewhere. That's what you can't lose focus on. And it's easy to lose focus when you're looking at stuff right in front of your face instead of what the Lord has planned. Go ahead. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what Jesus is. So we on our way behind him. Go ahead. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Uh -huh. And whom he called, them he also justified. Uh -huh. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. See, we got all these great promises that the Lord going to do for us. He already the it in stone. So why are we going to let some negative stuff stop us from getting our blessings? And that's what happened. Negative stuff going to be there. Haters going to be there. It's, it's just inherited. Everybody had them in the Bible. But they knew better than to let that affect their motivation with God. Go ahead. What shall we say then to these things? What shall we say to these things? This is where we want to get to. Go ahead. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the bottom line. They couldn't do nothing with Joseph. They couldn't do nothing with Joseph. They wanted to kill him. They know where they want to kill him. Let them starve to death. Then they finally sold them. That don't matter. That's why you can trust God in, under any circumstance. So this is what he's saying. This is what he means by all things. He said, what shall we say to these things then? If God be for us, who can be against us? People will try, but it's not going to work in the end. 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us that's, all. That's what he did. Go ahead. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Go ahead. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Mm -hmm. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? 
is it is Christ that died. Mm -hmm. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make an intercession for us. That's what he's doing, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who or even what? Nothing. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Go ahead. Shall tribulation? Now, that's bad stuff. Shall tribulate? Because that's what the goal is for you to faint. But shall that do it? Shall tribulation separate us from the love of Christ? Uh-uh. Go ahead. Or distress? Or distress? Or persecution? Uh-huh. Or famine? See, all this is bad stuff, brother and sister. But he meant all things work together for good. So you can't let that knock you off your mission. He says, shall tribulation, shall distress, persecution, or what else? Or famine. Oh, this is bad. Famine, what else? Or nakedness. Nakedness. You can be naked. It don't matter. If you believe in God, you're going to have a wardrobe. Go ahead. Or peril. Uh-huh. Or sword. Or peril. Or sword. Even if people have died for the Lord, that can't separate them. The Lord overcame death. So you really can't lose when you use the truth. Go ahead. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. See, we kill and some people get delivered. But that's why people knowing this truth, they didn't care about their life. We're going to die anyway one day. So it's already inherited. That's why the brothers told Nebuchadnezzar, we ain't bowing down to your statue. He said, I'm going to give you a chance. Don't even give us no chance. I'm going to play the music one more time. You don't bow down. He said, look, King. You ain't got to play no more music. We can answer that now. We not bowing down. You going to put us somewhere, that's up to you. These brothers was not scared of death. That's what I'm saying. These people that knew the Lord right, they was beast. They was like something. I look at Jonah. You know, Jonah, people, you know, he wasn't, he was a strong servant. He, he ran from doing God's will because he didn't want God to say the people had been punishing Israel. He wanted God to take vengeance on so he didn't want to preach to him because God was saying, if y'all don't repent in 40 days, I'm going to destroy him. Jonah didn't want to tell him because he wanted God to destroy him. So he's trying to do God's business. And God was like, nah, you do what I told you. You go preach to him. If they repent, I'm going to save him. Jonah didn't want him to save him. So he went preach to him. But I look at how he just trusted the Lord because when them cats told him, some of us would have been lying to the end when they said, you know, one of us, one of somebody, this, this storm is happening because of one of us. Jonah was like, it's me. It's me. I ran from the Lord. They said, what should we do to make the storm come? He said, throw me off. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> we're going to have to pray some more. <laughs> Jonah was a goon. He was like, yeah, throw me in the ocean. <laughs> and they threw him in the ocean. And the whale swallowed him up. They don't make him like that. You know, whatever happened, it don't matter. That's how you need to be, especially in this world, because people are going to threaten to kill you again eventually, some of us, for doing right. So this is what he said, verse 36, read it again. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. For thy sake we killed all the late day long. Go ahead. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Uh-huh, but what does that make us in the end? What? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. You're trying to overcome. You're conquering something. And the first thing you got to conquer is your own mind. Go ahead. Through him that loved us. Go ahead. For I'm persuaded. He said, finally, I'm at the point, and this is where we're getting to. I am persuaded that what? That neither death nor life. Neither death nor life. What else? Nor angels, nor principalities. Go ahead. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. What else? Nor height, nor death, <laughs> nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. You got some regular announcements? Yes. Praise the Lord. We welcome you and hope today's lesson increased your knowledge of the Holy Bible. CDs and DVDs of the Sabbath lessons are available. Please place your order and donation in the offering envelope and will be filled on the next Sabbath. The children's class ages 5 through 12 starts at the same time as the adult Sabbath lesson in assigned location. Bring your child so that their knowledge may be increased. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Adult question and answer is from 4.30 to 6.30 after the Sabbath lesson. We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. 
The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson or see the live stream of question and answer at www.kingdomcome7.com. If you're interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during service times. Women should wear head coverings, such as a hat or scarf, during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she is settled. Your tithes and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in the offering envelope and deposit it in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming. We hope to see you on the next Saturday. Peace. Peace.